In the heart of medieval warfare, one machine stood above the rest. Not because it was fast, not because it was flashy, but because it was unstoppable. Built from timber, rope, and raw calculation, the trebuchet wasn't just another siege weapon. It was the wrecking ball of the Middle Ages. It didn't need gunpowder, it didn't need an engine, and it didn't need to get close. With a single swing, it could bring down towering walls, shake the ground beneath a fortress, and crush the confidence of any army hiding behind stone. In this video, we dive deep into the brutal power, the engineering genius, and the psychological dominance of the trebuchet, medieval history's deadliest artillery machine. Number 1. Why Trebuchets Change the Game In medieval warfare, capturing a castle wasn't just about bravery or numbers. It was a brutal, calculated operation that required patience, strategy, and the right tools. Castles were built specifically to resist attacks, with high stone walls, deep moats, narrow choke points, and defenders positioned to rain down arrows, rocks, and boiling substances from protected heights. Charging the front gate was never a real option unless the attackers had a death wish. Earlier siege equipment like battering rams or scaling ladders often meant getting dangerously close to those walls under a constant barrage from above, which usually resulted in heavy casualties with little reward. Most of the time, besieging forces had to camp out for weeks or months, hoping to starve out the defenders. But that all began to change when the trebuchet entered the battlefield. Unlike earlier siege engines that relied on muscle power or twisted ropes for propulsion, the trebuchet introduced something far more efficient, gravity. That shift completely transformed how medieval armies approached a siege. The key wasn't just the distance or the damage it could do, but the way it allowed armies to strike from a position of safety. A trebuchet could be placed far outside the range of archers on the walls and still lob massive projectiles with deadly accuracy and crushing force. This meant attackers no longer had to rely solely on manpower and risky frontal assaults. They could bring down sections of a wall, tear through towers, or destroy defensive structures without ever stepping into the range of enemy fire. The psychological effect of this was massive. Defenders inside the castle who once felt secure behind a thick stone now had to watch helplessly as their walls cracked, their towers crumbled, and their morale collapsed alongside the fortress itself. The trebuchet's strength wasn't just in the size of the stones it could hurl, but in its consistency and adaptability. Engineers could tweak counterweights, angles, and sling lengths to increase distance, control trajectory, or hit a specific part of the wall over and over again until it gave out. This was an entirely new way of fighting. It wasn't quick, but it was methodical and overwhelming. The weapon essentially turned castle warfare into a demolition job and it gave besieging armies the upper hand in a way they never had before. When a trebuchet showed up outside a castle, it didn't just bring firepower, it brought a countdown. Everyone inside knew that once it started firing, the clock was ticking. It redefined siege warfare not by charging through the gate, but by making that gate irrelevant. Number 2. Simple Materials – Devastating Effect the most unsettling thing about the trebuchet wasn't its size or the destruction it could unleash. It was how incredibly simple the whole machine really was. While many medieval innovations relied on complex mechanisms or rare materials, this engine of war was built using resources available in almost every region where conflict erupted. What made it dangerous wasn't advanced technology, but the clever use of basic principles that turned ordinary timber and rope into a force capable of flattening a fortress. The core structure was straightforward. A sturdy wooden frame, a long beam mounted on a central axle, a sling attached to one end, and a massive counterweight hanging from the other. Once assembled and balanced, this system worked almost like a giant lever, but one designed specifically to break things. What truly set the trebuchet apart was how effectively it turned weight and gravity into raw power. When the counterweight, often several tons of stone or lead, was released, it dropped straight down, and the beam snapped upward with tremendous force. This sudden burst of energy flung the projectile from the sling, hurling it high into the air and sending it crashing into enemy defenses with terrifying momentum. These weren't just random throws into open ground either. 
Crews trained specifically to fine-tune their aim, working together to adjust tension, angle, and timing with surprising precision. Targets weren't chosen at random. Siege engineers directed fire toward weak points in the wall structure, aiming for load-bearing sections, battlements, or defensive towers. And when the stones hit, the damage was immediate and brutal. Depending on the size of the machine, a single shot could send a rock weighing hundreds of pounds into a wall with enough speed to shatter stone and send debris flying in every direction. That kind of impact didn't just cause structural failure, it made the interior of the castle dangerous for the people defending it. Soldiers behind the walls weren't protected anymore. Those near the point of impact could be killed instantly, crushed by falling stone or torn apart by the force of the strike. And the worst part? It just kept coming, as long as the crew had the strength to reset the counterweight and reload another projectile, the trebuchet could continue hammering its target until something gave way. This wasn't a weapon that struck once and waited, it was designed to hit over and over again until the defenders had no wall left to stand behind. Number 3. The fear was half the battle. When a trebuchet appeared on the horizon, it wasn't just a matter of engineering or firepower. It was a psychological operation in motion, one that started long before the first stone ever left the sling. For the people trapped inside a besieged castle, the construction of this massive machine was often the beginning of the end, and everyone watching from the ramparts knew it. There was something deeply unsettling about seeing the enemy calmly, methodically building a weapon you knew was capable of reducing stone walls to rubble. It was a slow process, but one that sent a clear and chilling message. They weren't in a hurry because they didn't need to be, and sooner or later, they were going to break through. This wasn't simply a machine of war, it was a declaration of intent. The enemy didn't have to yell threats or send messengers. The trebuchet said everything. The moment the counterweight was lifted and the first projectile flew into the sky, it became clear that this was not going to be a standoff, but a systematic destruction. The first wave of attacks often began with heavy stones, aimed not only to damage the walls but to send shockwaves through the hearts of the defenders. After that, attackers might begin mixing in fire pots, ceramic containers filled with pitch, oil, or burning materials, which would burst on impact and set parts of the fortress ablaze. But it didn't stop there. In many sieges, the psychological pressure was turned up even further. Trebuchets were often used to launch something far worse than just stones or flames. Rotting animal carcasses, infected corpses, even dismembered remains of captured comrades were hurled over the walls, not just to physically foul the interior, but to crush morale and spread fear. Disease was a weapon. Despair was part of the plan. Defenders could only watch as each day brought a new form of torment, knowing full well that even if the walls held, their minds and spirits might not. The anticipation of destruction was often more powerful than the destruction itself. Some garrisons surrendered before a single stone hit, simply because they believed there was no hope once the trebuchet was in place. And that belief wasn't unfounded. The mere presence of the machine symbolized something irreversible, that the attackers were in control of the pace the power, and the outcome. In many battles, it wasn't the crumbling walls that led to collapse. It was the crushing weight of inevitability. Number four, engineers were the real MVPs. Behind every great trebuchet wasn't just raw muscle or clever design. It was the skilled hands and minds of the engineers who made the impossible feel inevitable. These weren't nameless workers or background figures in the army. They were vital to the success of any siege and often held in high regard by commanders who understood exactly how much depended on their precision. Trebuchets couldn't simply be thrown together on a whim. They required a deep understanding of weight distribution, mechanical leverage, material strength, and timing. Because one miscalculation wasn't just a delay, it could be fatal for the entire crew. These machines, massive and powerful as they were, needed to function with exact balance, and it was the engineers who made sure every component was aligned and ready to endure the pressure of constant use. 
Constructing a trebuchet usually started with scouting the right kind of wood. Builders needed large, straight logs with no warping or rot. Something strong enough to handle the tension and weight, but flexible enough to resist cracking under force. Once materials were gathered, everything had to be built directly at the siege site, often under enemy observation and sometimes even within range of harassment from arrows or crossbow fire. This meant engineers and builders worked quickly but carefully using iron brackets, custom-cut joints, and reinforced pivots to make sure the structure would hold up through repeated firings. The counterweight mechanism alone had to be perfectly balanced, or the projectile would either fall short, veer off wildly, or worse, spin backward and endanger the crew. And when it was finally assembled, the trebuchet didn't just serve as a weapon. It became a symbol of preparation, patience, and power. Some rulers took so much pride in their war machines that they gave them names and treated them almost like battlefield champions. These siege engines weren't just functional, they were admired. During longer campaigns, trebuchet duels even occurred, with opposing sides setting up their own machines and trading shots across the field, testing range, accuracy, and engineering skill in what felt more like brutal artillery chess than typical hand-to-hand -hand combat. What made the engineers truly stand out wasn't just their ability to build these massive devices, but their calm under pressure. They stayed focused, solving complex problems in the chaos of a battlefield, all while knowing that the success of the entire siege often rested on whether or not their machine worked exactly as planned. Number 5. It wasn't just big, it was smart. What made the trebuchet truly stand out on the medieval battlefield? wasn't simply the size of the machine or the weight of the projectiles it could hurl. It was the level of control, consistency, and precision that commanders and engineers could achieve with it. While other siege weapons relied on twisted ropes or early and unpredictable gunpowder mechanisms, the trebuchet operated on something far more stable. Gravity. That gave it a level of reliability that other machines at the time simply couldn't match. Unlike torsion-based engines, which gradually lost power as ropes stretched or snapped under tension, the trebuchet delivered force through a counterweight system that didn't weaken with time, which meant it could fire shot after shot with almost the same power, even after repeated use. More importantly, it wasn't just about power, it was about smart targeting. With enough practice and the right adjustments, trebuchet crews could zero in on specific parts of a structure. Engineers would experiment with the length of the sling, shift the pivot point, or add weight incrementally to dial in the exact trajectory they needed. Once they locked in on a target, whether it was a corner tower, a section of wall with visible cracks, or the central gate itself, they could keep landing projectiles within a few meters of the same impact zone. That consistency wasn't just helpful, it was devastating. Walls could only absorb so much before they started to buckle, and with repeated hits in the same place, even the strongest fortifications eventually gave way. Some armies took it even further, customizing the ammunition for specific effects. Rough, jagged stones were chosen when maximum shattering force was needed, while smoother, rounder stones were used for longer range and more stable flight paths. In some cases, they even used bundled stone clusters or fire pots when aiming to damage both structures and people. That kind of tactical flexibility made the trebuchet more than a simple bludgeoning tool. It was a siege weapon that could be fine-tuned and adjusted like a modern piece of artillery. What this created on the battlefield wasn't just destruction, it was systematic elimination. Defenders quickly learned that once a trebuchet found its mark, it would keep pounding that same location relentlessly, not just weakening the structure but wearing down the morale of those inside. The fear wasn't only in the initial impact, but in the realization that every shot after would land just as hard, in the exact same place until everything collapsed. Number 6. The Last Days of a Giant As the medieval world began shifting toward new forms of warfare, it was only a matter of time before even the most dominant siege machines were eventually replaced. The rise of gunpowder technology brought with it a new era of weaponry that moved faster, hit harder, and operated with a very different kind of energy. Cannons quickly began making their mark across European battlefields, 
and compared to the bulky and time-consuming trebuchet, they seemed like the obvious future. They could be mounted on wheels, adjusted quickly and fired with devastating impact, sending solid iron balls straight through stone walls that once resisted even the heaviest stones. Reloading was faster, aiming more straightforward, and the psychological effect of their thunderous blast shook not only walls, but nerves. Still, the trebuchet didn't vanish the moment gunpowder arrived. In fact, it held on longer than many would expect, especially in regions where the cost or availability of gunpowder weapons was still limited. Cannons were expensive, required skilled gunners, and were prone to accidents, especially in their early designs. In contrast, the trebuchet was familiar, dependable, and safer to operate when handled by experienced crews. It could be built on site using local timber, repaired with basic tools, and adjusted on the fly without the risk of backfiring or explosive mishaps. In some prolonged sieges where mobility wasn't a concern, commanders still chose the trebuchet, simply because it got the job done without requiring constant supply lines of powder and shot. Even into the late 15th century, there are scattered accounts of trebuchets being constructed and used alongside gunpowder weapons, showing just how effective they remained under the right conditions. Their silence compared to the roar of cannons also gave them a unique advantage in specific scenarios, especially at night or during surprise attacks. And despite being a relic of an earlier time, the moment one was assembled and began launching stones, its destructive potential reminded everyone why it had once ruled the art of siege. Its decline wasn't due to failure, it was simply overtaken by progress. But that doesn't change what it represented. The trebuchet was more than a weapon. It was a signal of inevitability, a methodical force that chipped away at even the mightiest strongholds. For centuries, it shaped the outcome of wars, brought kingdoms to their knees, and stood as a towering symbol of precision through sheer force.